Hi, I'm Victoria Baker. I'm the Vogue Codes editor at Vogue Australia. Welcome to the fourth event in our Vogue Codes virtual series of free webinars. This is the fifth year we've run Vogue Codes, our crusade to see women empowered by technology. But the first year we've gone digital and we're so happy to be reaching an even bigger audience with our inspiring speakers. I'd like first to acknowledge our partners as Vogue Codes wouldn't be possible without their support. Thank you to our presenting partner Westpac and supporting partners Audi, Barbie, Estee Lauder and Optus. We're really proud to partner with companies not only driving innovation and positive change themselves, but empowering women in technology and science along the way. Before we begin, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting. We especially acknowledge the continued strength and resilience of traditional owners during this time of crisis. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of other communities who may be on this platform today. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest, Kim Kulmone, who's joining us from Los Angeles. Kim is the Senior VP and Global Head of Design for Barbie and Fashion Dolls at Mattel Inc., which means she's responsible for the creative direction of the iconic brand that is Barbie. Let's start with a little bit of backstory. Barbie was launched back in 1959 by Ruth Handler, a businesswoman who wanted her daughter Barbara to have as many choices in life as her son Ken. In that sense, Barbie was always a, perf a purpose-driven brand and was born out of feminist ideas. Since then, over a billion Barbie dolls have been sold and the brand has over 99% brand awareness globally. Barbie hasn't always had a smooth ride though. Kim started with Mattel as a designer back in 1999. And as her role has grown, so has the conversation about what Barbie represents, what she might've been failing to represent and more broadly, what it means to be a woman. Kim and her team oversaw the redesign of Barbie in 2015 to include more diverse body shapes. And since then she's also launched a more widely racially diverse range of dolls, differently abled dolls, and a huge range of role model dolls, including recently a campaign team, including a black woman presidential candidate, Barbie. I'm gonna stop talking, but just before we start, if you have any questions for Kim, please do ask them in the Q&A chat box and I'll, I'll ask her as many as I can. Please also share your thoughts on social media. We would love to hear what you think. Uh, use the hashtag Vogue Code so we can see and share your comments. Okay, let's get started. Hi, Kim, how are you? Hi, Victoria, I'm great, thank you. Thanks for having me today. It's our absolute pleasure. I think you're at home in, um, in LA. How have you found working from home? You know, I think, um, look, first of all, not easy. It's a challenging time for everyone. Thankfully, uh, those of us that within my immediate family and within our teams are healthy, which is the, the most important thing. Um, everyone's adjusting. There are positives and negatives. You know, some of us are finding ourselves closer together, oddly, by, by working uh, through the screen and other things are a little more difficult to do. We can, all we can do is be grateful and try to learn from the experience as much as we can. You're right. Um, we have so much to talk about, but I do want to just get out of the way early. Was Barbie part of your childhood? Is it true that you had the highly coveted Barbie dream house or was it the camper? I, well, I have both. Oh, <laughs> I was I was a I was an only child and I was very lucky and I did happen to, you know, ask for Barbie for just about every occasion that I possibly could ask for her. So I had both. And um yeah, Barbie was a huge part of my childhood. Now I will say, being the good corporate citizen that I am, I was an equal opportunity Mattel toy lover because I had Hot Wheels and Barbie. So it wasn't just Barbie that I had, but I was also a big Hot Wheels fan as a kid. That's good. I know you, you started at Mattel um, just over 20 years ago when you were only a few years out of college. And obviously Barbie had been part of your childhood um, and Barbie was already a heritage brand by then. What was your perception of Barbie when you started? 
Yeah, you know, um, I loved her, as I said, I loved her as a child and I knew her as a child as this tool that I used to tell stories. Of course, that's not how I articulated it as a kid, but that is what I did. I was almost like a director of my own little movies every time I, I pulled out my Barbie dolls to play. And so that was my, my experience of her, but I also knew that culturally she was this powerful, you know, pop icon. So when I joined Mattel, you know, little did I know that I would end up in this position um, that I, you know, I adore and that I, I have so much um, gratitude for having as a head of design for the brand globally. But, you know, I always knew that she is was more than a doll and that the, the power in this in this platform is significant. And, um, you know, it, it was a uh, it was a bit overwhelming to even get, when I even first started to walk in those doors and see this amazing creation center where all of these uh, iconic brands are created. And you've done so much work with and for Barbie since then, which we're gonna talk about in more detail. What what kind of drives the, the changes that you've made, do you think? Yeah, you know, I, I will I'll say the number one thing that drives the changes that we make are consumers. You know, the Barbie is lucky enough to be a brand that is over 60 years old in an industry where where successful brands may be three to five years old. So what drives uh, the changes that we make is what we know has made Barbie successful, which is evolution. And Barbie is most successful when she is reflective of the world that kids see around them. And listening to our consumers and listening to kids and observing kids and, and living in the world that we live in is what drives our success as, as a brand that has lasted as long as Barbie has lasted. And Barbie is truly you know, a cultural icon. Um, I'm interested to know more about how you kind of collect and respond to feedback, which you know, isn't always good. Everyone has an opinion about Barbie. She's often referenced in, in TV or music or popular culture. How do you kind of think about that constant conversation in the context of your work? Yeah, feedback is critical. I mean, if our intention as a brand is to show girls that they can be anything, to inspire the limitless potential in every kid that plays with Barbie, then listening to that feedback from both children and families it is essential for us, um, you know, whether it's positive, whether we like what we're hearing or whether we don't like what we're hearing. And in fact, the things that we hear that don't align with our intention are even more important to me as the head of design than being in an echo chamber of someone giving us endless credit for the great things that we're doing. I wanna know where we aren't connecting with our consumers as much as I wanna hear the things that we're doing that are resonating. I think Barbie has Instagram now, right? Is that a, a big channel for you? It is. It is. Actually, there's, Barbie um, it has a huge presence within social media in general. Uh, on Instagram in particular, there are two channels. There's at Barbie and at Barbie Style. At Barbie Style is through the voice of Barbie as an influencer within a world of first-person narrative. And at Barbie showcases more of our kid-focused product line. Let's talk a bit more specifically about some of the, the huge kind of design changes that you and your team have pushed through. Um, mm -hmm. Project Dawn was the code name because, of course, it was super secret for the mm -hmm. launch of new body shapes for Barbie back in 2016. Um, I think we have a, an image that shows the, the kind of world of Barbie now, including some of those dolls that were launched back then. Yes. What were some of the things that you had to think about in order to add new iterations of, of Barbie's body into the mix? I mean, it, it really would. We'd need a whole separate episode for us to go into all the details of the things we had to think about on that journey. I mean, the first thing that you think about is, are you delivering something that your consumer base wants? My second thought is, you know, are, are we being true to the legacy of the brand? And is this a, a change that um, it will be positive for the brand in general? But when you get to into the details tactically, when you're talking about changing a body shape on a, on a doll that previously had consistent body shape for 
decades, literally decades, you have a lot to think about from a design and engineering standpoint. Will she still fit in the car? Will her clothes be interchangeable? This is what we refer to as a system of play that was very simplistic, easy, people understood it, everything worked together. Our proposition and provocation as a design team was that we explode that completely in order to more accurately reflect the world that girls see around them. And so being in service to our consumers and in service to the brand at the same time was, was the foundation of what we were thinking out about, but it was complicated. It wasn't easy. And we often laugh, laughed together that, you know, as design team saying, oh, this is why no one ever did it before, because it's not it's not as easy as as wanting to, you know, wave a magic wand and make that happen. It's, um, it, you know, with a brand like Barbie with such a long history, change can be difficult. But just because it's difficult doesn't mean that you don't need to do it. We've got an audience question just kind of on the practical side from Sarah. How long does it take to design a new Barbie? What is the the usual kind of time process there? It's a very good question. So some long-term projects, Project Dawn, for example, was in um, ideation for about a year and a half to two years. But that also takes into consideration some of the research and and the more internal complexities that we have to go through. A physical doll, we say on average, an average doll, anywhere from nine months to a year um, to go from ideation into line planning, into working with our retailers on how we're gonna sell it in to manufacturing, shipping and getting it on shelf. Can be done faster, but we don't we don't like to try to. <laughs> but yeah, so about, about nine months to a year. Especially not during this time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the the project on changes were were considered so culturally significant that, that Barbie made the cover of, of time yes. um, at that moment. How did that feel for you and your team? Oh my gosh, it was incredible. You know, there's there is a documentary called Tiny Shoulders Rethinking Barbie that in the US is on Hulu that sort of shows how it felt. I mean it was it was nerve wracking and um, and also so exhilarating to have the work that we did recognized for this significant cultural impact was important. And the reason it was important was because representation matters and having more people and more girls in particular see themselves reflected in the Barbie brand matters because it's important on a human level and it's important on an empathetic level for each other regard you know just me knowing that i am reflected in a brand as iconic as barbie that would feel great theoretically but also building empathy for one another and exposing kids to different kinds of people in the world and showing them that all kinds of people matter enough to be represented in a brand as iconic as barbie is truly meaningful the, the Tiny Shoulders um, documentary, I haven't been able to find it to watch oh. in Australia, but we do, there's trailer and there's a few snippets on YouTube, but um, yeah, I'd certainly recommend all the bits I have seen. <laughs> oh, you, you, I think you would enjoy it, Victoria. It's a, it's a very interesting, um, a, a really interesting piece that juxtaposes Barbie uh, with the women's movement and also follows our team as we're developing the new dolls. So it really does, for anyone who can, can find it, it does really give you insight into our process. And, and talking a little bit more about representation, um, more recently you, you've launched Barbies with a range of different skin tones and hair textures and, and facial features. Um, and I think we have another image that, that shows some of that lineup. What, and, and you've probably already partly kind of answered this, but what do you hope they can be for their their young owners. Now look, today's Barbie wears a hijab, has you know hair fibers that are way different than we used to have in, in the past. We have so much variety in order to more accurately represent the people that kids see around them. I mean, our hope is that one, that kids see themselves reflected in the brand because that representation matters, as I've stated, and also that we can build empathy for, for one another. But as we increase this, it also gives kids more ways to tell stories and create their own stories and open dialogue with each other. Um, you know, kids view the Barbie brand very differently than we do as adults. They view the world very differently. And in some ways it's much more simplistic and idealistic than I think the baggage that we as grown-ups place 
on the brand. But the more diversity that we can place in Barbie, I think the, um, the more accurately it shows kids uh, the world around them. Tell me a little bit more about, about the role that um, children play in your product development. How much time is your team spending with, with little girls or boys or both? And, and what's their goal from those interactions? Yeah, you know, as Barbie does sort of shed this image of a homogenized view of humanity and um, uh, the kids are an important part of that journey for us, uh, we spend countless hours with children in observation and, you know, design thinking is a big part of that. And, um, uh, you know, that, that does allow us to observe behavior, not just project some of what our perceptions may be of what a product should be, but to really observe our consumers and to build empathy for our consumers. Um, you know, their voices are essential in this process. And we spend time not just showing them products and asking them which one they like, but really time in conversation with them. We ask, we give them homework sometimes to do, fun homework though, um, where they can imagine what the, a certain Barbie would be. And, and we draw enormous inspiration from the kids that we interact with. You, you've told me before that the, the harshest possible judge of your work is a six-year-old child. <laughs> the worst. The worst. Well, because they, you know, there's no pretense and they're very honest and they have no problem telling you exactly how horrible your work is. So listen, you, you learn to develop a thicker skin when you're a toy designer. That's for sure. I remember sitting behind that glass in focus groups and the first time, you know, a five-year-old girl is like, forget it. This is horrible. You're like, okay, I can handle that criticism. No critique from a boardroom will ever hurt me as much as, you know, a five-year-old tossing your design to the side. <laughs> but they make me better and they make our work better. So we appreciate them. Yeah. Um, it, it's a difficult time now in the US, but an important time for conversations about racial diversity. And, and you've been telling us about the positive steps that you've taken down that path in the last few years. Do you think there is more to do for Mattel? And how will you approach that journey? Yeah, listen, that's a very simple answer. There's absolutely more work to do for Mattel. There's more work for me to do as an individual, for all of us to do as individuals, there's more work for us to do as brands and as companies. And foundationally for us, as long as our mission is to inspire the limitless potential in every girl, we can't do that without acknowledging that racism and racial inequality puts black girls specifically at an enormous disadvantage. And so our commitment is public. We will have more dolls of color, specifically dolls representing black girls. We will have more role models of color. We will have more black representation within our content, within our staffing, within everything that we do. So we're on a journey and it's gonna, you know, it's not gonna happen overnight, but we're committed to um, continuing to do better as a brand and as a company. We have an que audience question in from Sally. She says it's great that Mattel is creating such a diverse Barbie product and has this as a focus. Does this also translate to your workplace? Do you um, consciously focus on diversity in your employees in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, et cetera? We do. And, you know, but like a lot of places right now, we know we can do better. So this is also a public commitment, not just from the Barbie brand, but but from Mattel as well. A part of your commitment is um, focused on the Dream Gap initiative, mm -hmm. which is about combating the, the self-limiting beliefs that little girls develop. Can you tell us a little bit about that and I guess what you're hoping to achieve? Yeah. So. You know, there is research that shows that as early as the age of five, girls start to doubt their own competency in comparison to boys. As early as five years old, girls will start to think that they may not be as successful or as smart as the boys around them. Our core demographic are girls primarily ages five to eight. So we feel an enormous sense of responsibility to continue to invest in research and to help enable girls to move beyond that. And how do we close that dream gap? How do we um, let girls see that they can be anything and not just tell them that they can be, but how are we investing in our actions and, and in our funding of, uh, of other uh, 
people that are doing work to level this playing field for girls and, and to help um, close that gap in their consciousness. But also, you know, we as grownups um, are responsible for that. We as brands are responsible to figure out what is uh, causing girls to feel that way. You've spoken to me before about design thinking, which is, I think, the way that your design team approaches, obviously, mm -hmm lots of things and it, it's kind of been a buzzword for a few years but maybe isn't as widely understood could you explain what it is and and how your team use it yeah it's, it's really very simple i mean it sounds like a sort of like you're saying like sort of a uh, buzzword and and something that's very mysterious but really what it is about is about empathy and building empathy for the consumer base that you're creating products for. So rather than uh, simply put, rather than us having an idea of adults make and saying this is what you should have, we observe the behavior of our consumers more intently and develop product based on our observations of them versus just what they say they like or don't like. So it helps us put ourselves in their position, whether that's through dexterity or the play patterns that, that they have. And we spend a lot of time in that process of observation in order to create the products that we create. And, and is that what you mean when you talk about human-centric design? I've got an That's, audience question about that. Yeah, that, that is. That is exactly what it is. So it's putting the human being, who happens to be our consumer, at the center of everything that we do. So rather than it only being about what would be a nice evolution that would be next for the brand, we center it on the people that we're serving who are consumers. And we have a question from Abigail. She says, hi, Kim, big fan of your team's work. As part of your human-centric design approach, what type of qualitative research methods do you use as part of product development and how do they weigh in your decision-making? We do both qualitative and quantitative research. Qualitative is a lot of that time that my design team may spend in observation of kids. So uh, as, as intimate as a designer and one other child in a play group can occur. Um, it can also occur in play group pairs. Uh, we may not be testing an actual item to say, do you like it or you don't? What actually do you like? How much more do you like this than you like something else? But again, it's that the qualitative part plays a lot into design thinking because we aren't looking for a yes or no answer or something that is necessarily measurable in numbers, but it's what are we seeing happening and what, what are the more subtle attributes of what emerges when a child engages with, with our dolls. So it's everything from face-to-face -face play groups to focus groups to online testing. We've moved to a lot of online obviously research methodologies and, and platforms now because we can't test in person in the same way that we used to. But we're spending a lot of time with kids um, via Zoom calls, just like this. And I guess um, a, another audience question is around balancing, I guess, the progressive changes that you have made over the past few years with the commercial side. Is, you know, is there a risk that you are kind of ahead of what your consumers are ready to buy? Is that something you have to think about? We absolutely have to think about it. I think that now also I would say perhaps Project Dawn could be judged as too late, meaning it was something that the general public had had an outcry for for a long time. So some may view that as us taking too long to get to change. I think now that that has occurred, we are, um, as a design team at least, I won't speak for the rest of the team, but we're a little bit, we're addicted to that, to the progressive nature of moving the brand forward at a more rapid pace, not just because it's exciting as a designer, but because our society and culture is at a pivot point where so much change is happening. And we can actually be a, an agent for positive change as a brand. So, you know, you do risk that perhaps we could be viewing things as, as moving a little um, too quickly at times. But thankfully, we do have good gauges through our research team. And we also create a lot of product throughout the year. So there are spaces to take risks. I would say our retailers are great partners in that process as well. And they're another touch point that not only lets us know what they think, but also what our consumers are reflecting back to them. So you really do have to become um, a grand gatherer of information when working on a brand like Barbie and make some take some calculated risks along the way. So you're, you're kind of testing before you launch, launch something, but you're also in a way testing in real life after you launch. Do. Every product doesn't have to last forever. 
That's true. And so I would say that that's the, the beautiful, healthy balance that you want to find. You have a, a core steady thing that you know is going to be successful. And then in order to stay relevant and last as long as a brand like Barbie has lasted, you have to be willing to take calculated risks. We talk a lot about the diversity within the Barbie range now, and, and we're experiencing a lot of success with it. But Barbie's first black doll was in 1968. And at the time, that was revolutionary. And so Barbie and Mattel in general have a history of being at the forefront of diversity and inclusion and progress. And I think that that's part of the reason that the brands are as successful as they are. Uh, I have a question from Alison who says, hi, Kim, I'm watching with my eight-year-old daughter, Violet. Hi, Violet. We are, big, <laughs> we are big fans of Barbie. How did you start your career? Oh, wow. Um, that's a really long story. Um, I, <laughs> I started out as a, a temporary textile engineer. So I didn't study toy design. I didn't even know the idea of toy design existed. So to anybody that's watching with their kids and to any kids that are watching, toy design is a career. Like if you love toys, which I'm guessing probably 99% of the kids watching do love toys, um, consider being a toy designer. Um, so I started working as a temp, like I was working for nine months as a temp and I fell in love with the process and decided that I was gonna figure out a way to be there. I studied interior design and textile design formally and, and transferred those skills into toy design and worked my way through the process to where I am today. That's a great story about sort of switching your your skills to to what you want to do and now obviously you're an incredible leader um, of, a, of a big team I know you've worked with a, a professional coach in recent years how has yeah. that developed your thinking about leadership or changed your leadership style perhaps you know it's very interesting as we're talking about design thinking and centering empathy I would say um the world is calling all of us to a different form of leadership right now. And I think that that leadership is based in empathy and based in service. Um, you know, as a designer, I'm in service to my con consumer. And as a leader, I am in service to the people that I lead. And so leading from that position of empathy and, and through true servant leadership, I think is one of, of the insights that I've gained um, of working with my coach. And I, I would also say that, you know, we need, um, we need girls to step into that position of leadership as well. And we need more, more girls to be able to see themselves as leaders in the world because we need their unique talents and their unique points of view um, in, in order for us to, to maybe get our planet into a little bit of a different state for the next generation. We have another question about, um, I guess, about change and pushing change through in, in a big organisation. Um, the question from Rachel is, and I think it's probably referring back to the, the Project Dawn, you know, the, those big momentous changes. What was the change process in the boardroom? Were, were, was the senior management open to this evolution of Barbie to be more inclusive or was that something you had to learn to push for over a period of time? Yes and yes is the answer. So I would say there is, there is an openness from some, a hesitance from others. There was an openness from um, even on, on the uh, cross-functional team. Some people were more comfortable with change than others. Uh, I, get, I do get asked frequently, like, what was it like to have to push it through? And at the risk of, of sounding redundant, empathy played a huge part in that process as well. Because when we found ourselves uh, as a team uh, pushing up against no's from people or hesitance from people, taking the time to understand why they were saying those things or why they were opposed to the change actually led us to maybe in micro ways shift our design and shift our approach to make it better. So rather than just being frustrated or giving up or trying to force it through, really listening to people that were in opposition actually led us to a better creation in the end. So, you know, opposition isn't always a bad thing. It helps us refine and, and fine tune our approach and, and what we're delivering creatively. And it, it, that sounds like a very collaborative way of working. Is that, would you describe it, it that way? It is. It is. Yeah. And I would say sort of facilitating, like we often, I often say, my team and I often say, like, how do we get to yes 
So like, what would it take? You know, what would need to be true in order for us to get to yes on some of these things? And, and in that process, we inevitably get to a better place. Um, I think I've got time for just one or two more <laughs> audience questions. One's coming from Emma. Um, I love seeing Barbie in a wheelchair. As a child of the 90s and 2000s, I loved that they released a doll that looked like me. Do you have any plans to release a wheelchair Barbie as part of the careers line as a journalist or a reporter or a teacher or a doctor, et cetera? That is a fantastic idea. I mean, we have so many drawings and so many ideas in, in the works that, you know, um, it is difficult for me to talk about you know, the future of Barbie, because I can't share details. But listen, on this brand, anything is possible. And I think that that's um, an enormously positive idea, actually. I think. Um, <laughs> one other question, which may be too difficult for you to answer. What is your favorite Barbie of all time and why? Not difficult at all, actually. Um, her name was Beauty Secrets Barbie. And she was my absolute favorite doll when I was a kid. And so it's easier because I go back in time versus the one that my team and I have been responsible for creating. But she was beautiful and she was in head to toe pink, everything, all even the same shade of pink. But the reason I loved her was because she came with this little lavender suitcase that had all of these little like play pieces in it, a toothbrush, a powder puff, all of these things that I couldn't find in any other product. And it was those storytelling pieces that actually made me love her. And so when I hear from girls that they, what they love about Barbie, it doesn't surprise me at all because it was the same thing that I loved. It was that connection to reality for me and my ability to create scenes and tell stories with her. And, and finally, I know you can't talk specifically about anything coming up for Barbie, but are you optimistic about the lockdown giving you and your team some space to think and perhaps sparking some creativity, even though you're apart? Absolutely, I am. I'm very optimistic. And the reason I'm optimistic is because I see us overcoming adversity and and thinking of, of everything differently. How we work together, we have to think about it differently. How are our, our children that we are developing toys for and families are living differently. It just poses another design challenge in a way for us. Um, but what keeps me most inspired is the optimism of the kids that we see. I mean, we're on screens with them now and they're so resilient and, you know, and, and the opportunity to serve families and children in a new way. They need play now more than ever. Kids need interaction with each other and toys now more than ever. And so play brings joy and, and development for them. And, you know, it's exciting to be able to be in that industry at this time. Thank you so much, Kim. It's been so Thank wonderful you. to talk to you. We really appreciate your time. You're really living your ethos of bringing joy and love to the world one doll at a time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Vogue Codes. Thank you to everyone creating this platform. And um, thank you for watching. Thank you to everyone who's joined us and sending questions. We're sorry if we missed a few of them. We're now live with our official Vogue Codes events program. You can visit vogue.com.au forward slash codes for the details and to register. You can also subscribe to the Vogue Codes podcast for more conversations with inspiring women in technology. We look forward to seeing you at one of our upcoming events. Thank you.